has your advice for home service businesses changed or like evolved at all? Is there anything that you've been telling them to do differently since uh, we had to go into the, uh, the great indoors? Customers are buying like crazy. It's been hard to get materials. So supply chain and then human capital hiring has been tough. So what I've taught them to do is when you got too many clients and not enough people or supplies, you raise your prices so you could run half the calls and make the same amount of money and keep happier customers. It's that simple. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Business Savvy, our educational podcast for field service and home service business owners. As always, I am your host, Nick Worker. Now, if you run a home service business, our guest today is someone you really need to be following. He runs the home service expert, a top learning resource for ambitious home service entrepreneurs. He's also the author of the Amazon bestselling book, Home Service Millionaire. And he's also a highly successful home service business owner and has truly been through it all. Uh, Tommy Mello is here with us today. Tommy, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for letting me be here. Very excited. Yeah, us too. So I want to talk about your book. Uh, in your book, the not the yeah, there it is. Home Service Millionaire. You share the incredible story of how you took a single garage door service business with fifty thousand in debt to over thirty million dollars in just seven years. Uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about that journey and uh, a few of the like the major turning points that took place for you along the way? Yeah, yeah. So this year, if everything goes right, we're doing a couple acquisitions. We'll be at about 100 million. We just passed our fourth hundred employee. We're in 19 states. Um, we're still um, small in my my eyes. I think this we're just getting started. Um, I'm having a lot of fun, and the fun is starting to get more and more every day. I enjoy coming into work. Uh, 2007 is when I got the business started. I had a partner. Um, we didn't know what we were doing. We literally worked in the business. We did the accounting, the inventory. We answered the phones. It was just two of us. We, we did everything and uh, had no idea what I was doing and uh, got into some debt, bought him out for about 50 grand, um, hence the $50,000 in debt. 2010 happened. I persuaded my mom and stepdad to come work for me. So they moved from Michigan to Arizona. And uh, that was a catalyst because I finally had somebody I could trust around me that actually could do stuff that I didn't like, like answer phones and handle the books. Um, I could do that stuff. Uh, I ended up getting a master's degree in business, but I've always learned to delegate the things I don't like. Uh, so continue to make a lot of mistakes. In 2014, I had a very good hire. Um, he's kind of, uh, it's what I would call, I'm the visionary, he's the integrator. Um, so got him on board and then, uh, we got a, a great CRM in 2017 called service type. That was another catalyst. And then I'd say one of the other biggest things that I really learned was just having a process. I learned how to do an org chart and the depth chart and really have great manuals. I actually have some of my core manuals and five of them right here. And then I we're up to 40 manuals and, uh, then I'd say within the last few years, I became really, really, really good at financing. I learned how to tell you everything that there is to know about key performance indicators within the business. And I keep a close eye on them as the owner, as a CEO, or as whatever you'd want to call me. And uh, here we are. I mean, uh, the business is worth a lot of money and um, I'm involved in a lot of arbitrage right now. And my plan is to try to buy 200 garage door companies next year. So that is my story. Well, Congratulations on the success. That's awesome. Um, I love the origin story of entrepreneurs because it never starts out as uh, I knew everything I was doing. It all went great. I never learned anything along the way. Everything I was doing then is currently applicable right now. And, uh, you know, I haven't changed a single thing or hired anybody. I'm just one guy doing it by myself, hundred million. It's never that it's always, uh, I was in like my mom's basement and, you know, figuring it out. And, you know, I had the wrong people around me and I took some bad advice and, you know, it's, it's those people you want to hear from because they learned the lessons that you can kind of skip over. You don't have to like take the, the same, uh, what I would call, uh, the low road. Right. But you know, it's not like, uh, I won't even, I'm, I'm getting too, uh, moral, and ethical. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me today. 
Um, but you, you obviously you work a lot with, uh, with home service businesses. So what are some of the like more common marketing mistakes that you see them making? Cause obviously you're, you've got to be one of the, the best marketers we're going to have on the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you got to pivot your brain a little bit. I'm a very, very good marketer. I love marketing. Um, that's one of my attributes. I have a lot of failures. I'm a bad organizer, bad with time management, bad with a million things, but I'm obsessed with marketing. And don't think as much about marketing for the customer anymore. Think about marketing for the employee. Think about an employee. What, what, what's great about an employee? Why would I market for employees, Tommy? Well, first, they get five-star reviews all over the internet. It's called user-generated content. They get videos for you, testimonials. They have a higher conversion rate, a higher average ticket. They're fun to work around. They don't call you at midnight. They don't quit on you when you need them the most. Great employees will help you recruit A players. They'll help go get you customers. When they go to church, they'll get you two customers. As long as you build a way for them to make a little bit of that money with them. So biggest mistake in marketing is we spend a fortune acquiring customers. We spend no money acquiring great employees, my internal customers. So I say focus a lot more time, energy, and focus on figuring out how to get A players because A players love other A players. And part of that is having a great recruiting program, a great training pro program, a great orientation, and a great way to continue to train them. And then you got to retain them. So that's first and foremost. Number two is uh, you got to be obsessed with Google. Google is God when it comes to home service. Uh, they've got four algorithms for home service. I'll go through them quickly. They've got pay-per-click. You can pay to be at the top. Every time someone clicks on you, you pay. Second one is called LSA ad, local service ads. It's called the Google Guarantee Program. You can spend some good money on that. It's way cheaper than pay-per-click. They're going to do a background check on everybody, including the owner and the person that's out to the home. That is something you're going to want to do for sure if you're in the home service space. Number three is called your Google My Business page, and that's where they got your hours of operation. Do not have closed Saturday and Sunday. Stuff does not break. When you choose for it to break, be open at least 14 hours every day. Well, I don't make my guys work Sundays. Well, you're making a mistake. I, I appreciate that you're a Christian and everything, but uh, the stuff still breaks on Sundays. Um, and, uh, and then the last one is just organic search. And people think the website doesn't count as much anymore. And unfortunately, it really does count. It's just not the same way. You want to start ranking for things like uh, when people do research, none of those ads and none of that other stuff show up. So you can research the top brands versus each other. Uh, there's a great book called They Ask, You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. And he speaks about some of the things that he's got a pool company that he's busy for the next three years. He's not taking on any business. So stuff that he talks about works. But uh, those are a few pointers that I can tell you to start out. And then uh, one very, very big one that people make a mistake of is they don't have call tracking numbers on every source of marketing. I can tell you I have 4,000 call tracking numbers. So I know every campaign I renegotiate all the time, I can attribute exact revenue versus how much I spent per acquisition. And right now I'm at 9.7% of my marketing, but a lot of that's because I'm growing other markets. It's spread out. Some of them are at 5%, some of them are at 15%. So I don't even really have to like jump in and clarify anything because that was all like true and correct. And I agree <laughs> with it. And, uh, like sometimes I jump in and I'm like, oh, you forgot one thing and, and uh, I have to add to it. But I think the one thing that I could even talk about is, and I've been talking about this with a lot of people lately is call tracking and people aren't tracking their calls. So I recently did a podcast with somebody. I was on a, like somebody else's show and they're like, uh, you know, what's, what's some of the, 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 the great reasons that you can get an answering service. You know, I'm going through it. Obviously, that's what I do. It's, it's, I make a vocation of it, right? And they're like, oh, do you record phone calls? I'm like, no, for like legal reasons, I cannot record phone calls. If I got 4,000 customers and I'm recording phone calls all day, first of all, I had a, I'd have to have a crazy database to keep track of all of the recorded phone calls. Second of all, it's a huge legal liability and, and it's different in different states, right? I'm sure you know this too. Um, but I don't stop anybody from from putting call tracking on their phone numbers. In fact, I encourage it, right? So, you know, if I'm forwarding you a phone call and I'm not forwarding it to one of your, your tracking numbers or you're not forwarding your tracking number to me, 
And you don't know where you got that customer from because I can tell you what they say, but what people say, oh, I saw it online. I saw the ad. I saw this. Uh, you know, I was was on my way home and I, I, I saw like a, like a bus ad or something. That's not real attribution. That's not really telling you where your money's coming from, like that return on ad spend and, and how you know, oh, I'm 9.7%. That's impressive, but it's what you need to know in order to be successful because how are you going to know what to take money away from when it's not working out really well, what to add money to when it's going nuts or, or where to expand, you know, you're, you're, you just have no picture of where your business is coming from. So how could you possibly try to, to scale that? You wouldn't know where to begin. Um, so I think we're, we're kind of drifting into this a little bit, but one of the things that you cover in your book extensively um, is how to market a business correct, uh, correctly, correctively, what an idiot. Uh, on a shoestring budget. So what are some like marketing avenues or strategies um, that home service business owners should be prioritizing if they don't have that big budget to play with? Uh, well, number one thing you got to do is get a freaking great rap. The branding is everything. Your mailers need to look like your business card. They look like your vehicle. They need to look like your yard signs. They need to look like everything needs to be unison. There's so many people out there driving just a stenciled out truck and they, they don't understand. It doesn't, you see my trucks everywhere and now you see my billboards and now you see the radio, the TV, they all work in unison. So get the brand right from day one. Number one, number two, there are so many easy things. It's the David and Goliath. When you're David, you're, it's easy to do more things. So instead of getting one review for a customer, I want you to call up every friend. It's a lot of, it's so easy. You call up your friend and you say, you got seven neighbors. I need you to figure out seven people and I'll call them for you. But I really am looking to do some free garage or tune-ups. I'm going to ask seven that I'm going to call them and ask for seven that I'm going to quick, easy hundred people. It's what you do from day one. You go out there, you do a free tune-up. They may need some stuff, get to them a good deal. Ask for five reviews. Don't just ask for one. Real reviews. I want, I want to know how I did. Just because they're friends and family doesn't mean that it's illegal to leave reviews on Yelp, Google, Facebook, next door, maybe the BBB, you add one in there. There's a, a lot of other ones. So getting the word out there is called user-generated content, and it's very important. It creates trust among uh, customers. So those are easy ways to win. Get your brand right. Get the reviews out there. And then I would say pick with something. So many people go, I tried, it, I tried an FM radio ad for two weeks. I tried one billboard. I tried to do the Google. They call it the Google. I tried the Google and I'm like, stick to something, okay? And what I would say is LSA ads for sure. Um, Google's a long game. So you got to make sure you're constantly getting reviews and, and, and building links on Google. But uh, I just word of mouth, ask for the referral. You see, if you ask, you shall receive. It's, it's not that hard. When you're, when you're small, you can do stuff on Groupon and Living Social. They're not the best customers, but you know what? You just need to get out there and figure out a way to make money with nothing because it's all sweat equity going into the business at first. So for for anybody listening who doesn't know what LSA is, local service ads, right? Um, what's your experience been like with that so far? Because I know that's like fairly new, right? Um, do you find it's hard to get set up on that? Because the number one complaint I hear about local service ads, it's never the quality of the lead that's coming through or, or anything like that. It's that it's hard to maintain a listing. Yeah, you know what? I've got a team that handles it here uh, that work for me, but I can tell you this. I love it. I wish it was harder. I wish there was more holes to jump through because that means my competition won't do it. Hmm. So I love the people that complain. Their life is so hard. And God, it's, uh, it's so tough. Okay, first thing you got to do as a business owner is learn how to delegate. And there's a process in which you delegate. You write it down. You get a signature. People understand. They show you that they can understand it. You put deadlines on stuff. And um it's not easy. You know, you got to go through, you got to get all of your employees to give all this information background and they do this background test and then they want to make sure you're a real business and da 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 da, da. And uh, it's really, really smart. It cleans up businesses. It keeps the, it keeps the trash out. We, we don't want, you know, what do they call it? Chucking a truck to, to just, I, those guys are just cheap. One thing I learned a long time ago, you could be the fastest, you could be the best or you could be the cheapest. You could do two out of the three, but you can't do all three. Hmm. So I chose I was going to be the fastest. I'm going to show up when you need me to, and I'm going to be the best quality. I got a mechanic in Milwaukee, one of the cities we're in. He's the best. He's a great price. 
You can't get to him for the next six months. He's booked out. You just can't be all three. Obviously, it's been a little different. I think I think for some home service businesses, it kind of boomed while we were going through uh, the uh, the period that shall not be named or else YouTube will put me into their algorithm and, and, and uh, what do you call that? Punish me for saying it. But uh, for, for 2019, right? Uh, has, has your advice for home service businesses changed or like evolved at all? Is there anything that you've been telling them to do differently since uh, we had to go into the, uh, the great indoors? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because what we've realized in this economy is much different than most. Uh, customers are buying like crazy. It's been hard to get materials. So supply chain and then human capital hiring has been tough. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd recommend is you, you get a little bit more time to reflect and start thinking, how do I create a better environment for my employees? You know, wages are going up. They're forcing inflation's happening. So one day I had a uh, 20 garage door companies upstairs and they said, uh, I, I went down a list and I wrote um, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, paint, and I just picked one thing. I said, an HVAC unit might cost 15 grand. It costs them 2,200. That's a seven times multiple. And I ended up saying it six or seven times all the way down the list. And then I said, let's do a garage door. How many of you guys would charge? And I, I think five or seven times the price was um, 1,500. It was 10,500. And I said, anybody charge that? They go, oh my God, hell no. We don't even charge half of that. And I go, do any of you guys uh, have PTO? brand new trucks, the best CRM in the industry. Do any of you guys have a 401k plan? Do you pay for Aflac for their employees like I do? Do any of you guys have the Dave Ramsey program? Can you afford that? Well, no. How, how much, how do you guys make that much? See, I care about my internal customers. I really care about them first. You guys have your, you guys work out of your house. Your wife works for you for free. Your kids work at darn near minimum wage for you. Your trucks aren't wrapped and you complain about my prices. So what I've taught them to do is when you got too many clients and not enough people or supplies, you raise your prices so you can run half the calls and make the same amount of money and keep happy your customers. It's that simple. But see, no one was predicting what was going to happen. So they just don't know. They were never taught sales, body language, eye contact, tonality. So they were a commodity business. They wanted to commoditize it. They looked at everybody else's prices, got right around there, did something else for free, and thought, I'm going to be a business owner. But guess what? This is survival of the fittest, and a lot of these businesses aren't fit. They don't understand what needs to happen. And you know what? It's a good thing for a lot of us that actually understand it. I was a small guy, but at least I didn't make the same mistake twice all the time. At least I started to look around me and take care of people and care more about the people that work with me and their wives and family and their husbands and family. And I wanted to make him a great mom and a great dad. I wanted to be able to spend a little bit more time. And I think that's the biggest thing I've taken out of this thing is now I'm always looking after my people going, what else can I do for them? What else could we do? There's a good book called The Dream Manager. I read it last night on the plane for the second time. And that's one thing we're going to be hiring is a dream manager, somebody that every month they talk to you about what are your dreams? Nick, what do you want to accomplish? What, what do you want to do with your kids? What do you want to do? Do you want to go on a second honeymoon one day? Do you want to go camping? What do you want to be when we grow up? You know, uh, we know we're working together now, but maybe there's something else in your future because we're going to help you accomplish your dream. This work is to accomplish a dream that we're going to help you accomplish. So the best thing is reflect a little bit and look at your business and see what's there because I think it's really important that we do that now. Uh, the business is there. Economy is there. And be prepared for inflation. Change your prices the day yours change. The days your change, change it for the customer because if you don't, you're going to get left behind. I've had six price increases in the last six months. Um, I have a little over 100% increase. We're doing great. No customers are mad about it either. They understand what's going on out there. You know, I always think of, uh, I, and I've been here ring savvy since like day three. So I was in, the tiny little room when we were a tiny little call center with like 50 customers. Now we're at, I don't know, in the thousands, right? Um, so I've seen both, right? But I always go back to, uh, I think this was like a TED talk he gave eight or nine years ago, but Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, right? Is talking about um, how different things are important to different people. And that's how you have to treat your employees. So, 
sure, money is a is a great is the great motivator for employees, right? But some people don't necessarily care that much about money. They care about their title. They want more respect. They care about time off. They want to spend more time with their family. They care about perks. They want the best benefits. They want a car. They want, I don't know, a gym membership. Name some stuff, right? And, uh, and you have to find out what that is for each person in your industry or in your industry, in your, in your organization, right? Um, so that's cool. I like that concept of like a dream manager. Like what's going to make you happy? What's going to make you stay here? Or what's going to help you grow? What's going to help you succeed here? Um, because if you have the best people and you provide the best service, you can kind of charge a little bit more for it. Um, and, well, you uh, can because if you're not going to be able to get there for three weeks and I can get there the same day, people expect to pay more for that. And they want it done on their schedule. You know, I know how much I make per hour and I'm going to hire almost everything around me to do everything I hate, like cook, clean, mow the lawn, anything that I could do to spend more time on what I'm really good at. If I could delegate, if I could delegate, if I could delegate showering, go to the bathroom, I would. Fortunately, that's not possible, but uh, if I could do it, I would. <laughs> that's, that's a thought. If I could delegate showering and go to the bath, I won't, I won't ask you more about that, but uh, <laughs> so, leave that one alone. we will be right back with the show after this short message. My name is Joe Fish. I'm the owner of Victorian Fence located in Long Island, New York. I've been a ring savvy customer for five years. They're very professional. They know exactly what to say. And when customers call, they have no idea that it's a separate answering service. With a product like Fence, if they don't get a live person, they're just gonna call the next Fence company. With Ring Savvy, I never miss a potential new customer. Ring Savvy is an extension of our business. I like to answer my phone, but during those real busy times of year, I can let it ring on my cell phone one time. And if I'm not able to get it, it will be forwarded to Ring Savvy where a professional sounding person will answer and take my phone call. Ring Savvy really helped me to be present whether I'm at work or at home. My kids are young, so when I'm home, I don't want to be on the telephone and trying to resolve issues. Ring Savvy is definitely giving me a better quality of life. One of the topics we end up talking a lot about uh, here is the new customer intake process, right? I, I pretty much make a, a living talking about how to get people to uh, like really sign up and, and buy from you. So we talk a lot about making sure that you're taking the appropriate steps to turn the people that you've generated with these ads and marketing efforts that we talked about before into callers, right? Calling, calling your business and, uh, and how to get those people into, into paying customers. So is booking phone calls an area you see a lot of home service companies struggling with or not really handling correctly? And, and what would you say to them? All right. I'm drawing something real quick for you. Uh, you kudos because I can't draw a stick figure. Well, it's, it's actually numbers. You got CSR A and CSR B. And I kind of put some numbers on here. I'll just tell you, CSR A is booking 60%. CSR B is at 90%. They, the average ticket of the company is $500. They each take 20 acquisitions per day, 20 opportunities a day. Mm -hmm. And they work 300 days out of the year. Do you realize that the 90% made $940,000 more wow. because they're an A player? 940K. So a lot of us look at our CSRs and we say, well, we're going to pay them 15 bucks an hour. All they do is answer the phones. That just costs you a million bucks. So what I say oh. is, there's a lot more to it than that. You got to create a process. You got to, you know, I don't want to sound back in the eighties and nineties. We used to go, Oh my God, Nick. Oh God, what happened? No, but we just say, Hey, hi Nick. Yeah. No, what's going on out there? Yeah. Yeah. It's still a phone voice. It's a friendly voice. It's an attentive voice. And there's some sympathy of, Oh my gosh, I hate, I hate when a car gets stuck. You know, we, we hear garages break all the time, but it's a, it's a real drag. And I understand what you're going through. Listen, what are your cross streets out there? Just a little bit to tell you a little bit about us, you know, and I'll go through over some little bit about us and we create a buyer's guide. So if you're looking for a new door, we're going to send you a buyer's guide. And what I love, Nick, if you took a few minutes to take a peek at this, it's going to tell you all the stuff you need to know about insulation or windows or different designs and the trim on the side. And it'll make the buyer's experience just a lot better for you. And what we found, this is a one, this is me talking what we found is if customers spend more than 20 minutes going through the buyer's guide, 
they're more than 80% likely to close. 20 minutes, 80% conversion rate or higher. Um, but when it comes to that, I just told you some simple math and people don't even understand it. You know, every single person that works for me, Nick, for the most part is performance pay. So my CSRs were on a VoIP system, voice over internet protocol, mm -hmm. and the phones don't ring simultaneously. It rings the top agents first. It does a round robin of this weighted. And I want to give my A++ A++ players a chance because my top players at a 97% booking rate, which is almost unheard of. Um, and that we don't, it's not that hard, but it is, it's the biggest failure point of most companies. Cause a lot of guys are, I think that the national average of home service with all the one man shops is around 44% booking rate. It's crazy. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I think, I don't know why this comes to mind, but, uh, when I was growing up, my dad owned a, a warehouse. He's a warehouser for, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what this is because it's like a, a, an East Coast thing, but new, uh, Wise Potato Chips. If you've eaten them, thank you. It put me through college. They're uh, great. I think I've eaten them. <laughs> so uh, obviously the way that you transport potato chips is, is in cardboard boxes on the back of 18-wheelers. Sure. Uh, so he's got a very big... He's got one very big garage door. And let me tell you, when that garage door goes down and he cannot receive deliveries, so that's a big problem. Um, so I know for him, he cost is a big thing, right? But I also know that he's, he's kind of going along what you're talking about. If you show up the same day, I'll pay you whatever. You know, just get here now because I need this thing open in order to receive a delivery. It's not... It's not a. Uh, it's not one of those things that uh, is sort of negotiable at that point. And I'm thinking about, you know, if if you're doing the, the intake right and you're understanding what the pain points are, right? Getting above a listen. If that guy call, if my dad calls you and you only got a 44 percent close rate, that's pretty bad. Um, so I'm thinking like, yeah, obviously you'd you'd want to have something set up that way, but. At the same time, I really like your process. And, and here's why is because I, I'm in the call center business, right? Um, one of the things that I tell all of my customers is like, forget about me, right? Forget about me being the, the backstop or the safety net, whatever you want to call me. You need to have a process in your building, in your business, whatever you want to call it, in your organization, where you know where that phone's going to ring. So if you don't have any clue of like, oh, it's going to go to my best agent first, or it's going to go here on the weekend, or it's going to go here at night, or I can't take it at this time. I'm going to forward it over here. If you don't know where the phone's going to ring, you've already really lost 90% of the battle with that with acquiring that customer. So I would urge anybody listening to this, not just to take that advice of, of get it to your best reps first and, and do like a round robin. I love that idea. It's weighted, but you need to make sure that it's at least getting to somebody, man. And that's, we call home service businesses all the time. And I can't tell you the amount of voicemail that I hear on a daily basis. It's really crazy that you're out there trying to be an emergency business, like a plumber, like people with plumbing problems. They're, they're not trying to wait. You need to answer the phone. I, so I, you I, know, I, I was going to show you every time the a, a CSR doesn't book a phone call or one of my guys leaves a job with less than $70 it text messages me. So it, it all goes into one text. So it doesn't bug the crap out of me if it was just fill it up. But this creates accountability. We did 12,000 jobs last month. So you could, you could understand that I get a yeah. few text messages a day, but that's called accountability. And what it does is I don't call hardly anybody that I see that pops up there. But when I do, they're like, oh my God, just the fact that I have that Whenever I'm doing my orientation with 30, 40, 50 employees, I show them this and they're like, holy crap. They're like, this guy is like, uh, he understands systems. And I think that's important because a, a business is just really a bunch of manuals, standard operating procedures, checklists. When it's done properly, that's what it is. If it's most businesses, unfortunately, they're firefighters and they, they, they're addicted to fire. They're addicted to it. They're not fire preventers. So you try to teach them a standard operating procedure and they go, this is boring. 
that we don't have any problems. We don't have anything to fix. But yet now they get to grow the next level of their business, the next level, then the next level. But I'll tell you what, you know, that famous line, keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Most home service business owners, they complain about the same crap every single time I see them. They, 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 they do the same exact stuff that they talked about last year and they're expecting everything to change and miraculously get better for them. And it's some of these people, I, I really do got to say, Nick, is uh, you shouldn't be in business. You should really think about going to be an amazing employee because most businesses fail. Actually, the, the, <laughs> the, the statistics are really against us for a 10 year business. Um, and, and a lot of people, they wait seven years of their life. They don't have a pot to piss in when they get done with it. And uh, maybe it made them stronger, but maybe that caused them to be a horrible mother, horrible father. I'm not trying to talk people out of business that are on this podcast. I'm just saying some people need to do some serious thinking if, if, if they think everything's always going bad and, and the earth is just against them. I tell people, listen, we, the earth, everything around us, the world is not going to change. We change up here. And if you're optimistic, if you think you're a winner, if you put your shoulders back and talk a little louder and make eye contact, you'll be more successful. If you always get your head down, you talk a little quiet, and you're always a victim, you'll always be a victim. So. I could talk about that forever. And uh, I think one of the things that that is really cool about this podcast is it's not always rah, 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 you should start a business. Here's why. It's we get to have people like you on here talking about like wake up calls. Like if you think that you're just going to like watch a podcast and suddenly have a miraculous epiphany and wake up extra motivated tomorrow and change overnight, it's just not going to happen. This is, this is like a mindset thing that you have to really commit to. Consistency. And, uh, Consistency. Oh yeah. Consistency. But that's, I listen, I could go on, I could go on forever because I know people. Um, I want to talk about your podcast, right? So you have a podcast for your company and you speak to honestly, some of the brightest business minds out there, right? Have you found that your guests share similar traits or habits uh, that, that drive their success? And, and, and what are those? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I get a lot of uh, consultants and, and authors and like I had Michael Gerber. Um, typically they're outgoing. Um, I would say they, they set up routines most of them have very, very good routines. Um, the biggest habits I can tell you is leaders are readers. They're all, everybody I have on my podcast when they come on, they got big names that come on. They're all big, avid readers. There's one thing I can tell you for sure is if you're not reading, it's a dirty shame. Audible super easy. I've got several books right here I'm working on. You can see in my background, there's a lot of books. Um, readers are leaders. That's one attribute. Number two is, is I think a lot of the people, they, they've really worked hard. The old Simon Sinek cliche is they figured out their why. They understand what they're doing. They understand what, they're, what the mission is at hand, their mission, vision, their core values. They work really hard to define what it is they are working on. Uh, too often, we just don't know. We know there's somewhere we're supposed to go, but we don't really know where. We're like, what does this life look like? What's going to make me happy? And uh, most of them have figured out a few things that they know that they need to get done. And, uh, you know, I haven't done this yet, but uh, a lot of them have a bucket list and I got to start working on mine. I just enjoy working too much, Nick. I, people go, man, how do you put in those hours? I'm like, I don't put in any hours. I literally am here. Like right now I'm in my office. It's closed. The door's closed. But if this is work, consider me in, you know, and this is what I do. I fill my day up with things that I enjoy doing. And uh, I've, I've had so many people share their life story with me and give me so much, so much attention, so much questions answered that I feel like stuff like this is just paying it forward and I enjoy doing it. I like that. And, uh, you know, I, I have a, I have a similar but different uh, like uh, outlook, right? I'm an employee. I don't own this place at all. Um, but I come in every day and I do stuff I like to do. You know, like I wake up and I don't dread going to work. I have friends that are coworkers of mine um, and, uh, I have plans to, to go into business in the future, but I honestly, I'm still at the point where, uh, I don't know. I haven't made that mental leap yet that like, I want to own something and build something. Um, I like to build things and I like to be a part of things. Uh, 
maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, a little fearful, but I do stuff like my my doors closed right now. I'm talking to a cool guy on a podcast, you know. And if you haven't found your why, if 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 what you're doing right now isn't I don't know, at least a little bit meaningful to you or or give you some sort of sense of joy or access to some you know like thing that you enjoy doing in your life. Like if you're a business owner, you might hate your business, right? But if it gives you the freedom to spend more time with your family or like start a band or bake, I don't know, whatever your hobbies are. I I give you kudos, right? Like you you might not like the work that you do, but if you have access to things like more time, then then I say you've made it, right? Um I do want to ask you this though cuz you you obviously have like we're talking 2007, right? So almost eh, like 15 years, right? 15 years of experience. So let's say, right, you could go back in time. You right now could speak with the Tommy Mello of like 10 to 15 years ago. What's the biggest piece of advice you, that you would give him about running a business? All right. This is a great question. And uh, the answer is, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, you go... Tommy, you go right now and you'd find the biggest and best of a similar industry. I would tell him to go to HVAC because HVAC in the early 90s uh, really got established to a next level. They learned what arbitrage is and they really made a lot of money. But I'd say go find the largest HVAC companies because it's similar to garage doors and be a student. Go there with 100 questions and continue to find out. Because The first thing is go to the biggest and best in the world. Get out of your comfort zone, get out of the state and go there with a hundred questions. And what I would do with that is watch the way they talk, watch the way they breathe, watch the way they dress, watch how they move, watch how the, every step has a purpose. Cause when you're around that and you see where the, you see where you have to go. Okay. You'll understand the destination of what you want to become that that's first. Next thing I'd say is, uh, Darren Hardy wrote a book, um, he wrote a lot of books. This book wasn't, he wrote the compound effect. He talks about it a little bit in there, but uh, he says, right. He wrote down a uh, hundred things that he wanted in a woman before he would even consider dating her. He wanted to find his perfect wife. He wrote down what she looked like, what she smelled like, what her hobbies were. He wrote down a hundred things. And he looks at his list and he goes, well, I better build a hundred things that I need to become to get a woman like this. So what happened was, the reason I tell that story is because I would tell young Tommy over here in his early 20s, I'd say, dude, I want you to write down 100 things that you love about the companies you've worked for. Because that's who you got to become. That's who you need to make A1 garage door service. You need to build that within your company. So watch the way the best are doing it. But the one thing I want you to change is make sure you remember what you love the most. And you need to build that. Think about that every single moment and make sure you read and read every day because reading is important. And I'd probably say, you know, don't date this girl and a couple other things, but. Uh... <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> can't do that. Yeah. yeah uh, you know what? I'm, I'm still thinking before about when you're, what you're talking about like the, the three things that you, you, can, you can either be the fastest, you could be the cheapest or you could be the best. Yep. And uh, you ever watch The Office? Yeah. So I'm thinking of the Michael Scott paper company, right? He's the cheapest and he's, you know, he's, he's got the, the chops and everything and they go to buy it out and, uh, and they look at his, or, or I think it's Pam like looks at his books and they're like, we're not making any money. You're selling the paper for what we bought it for. And he's like, that's not how it works. And I'm like, no dude. Like, so I think it's, it's important that if you're listening to this to like really assess how much money you need to make in order to do the things that we're talking about. Um, and work backwards, right? So know, know how much you need to make and then figure out how much you need to charge, how much you need to pay. Where, where are you going to find these people? How are you going to hire them? Where, oh, he's going to get a book. I had book. to. I had to. There's a great book. This you one do I'm read, man. Towards. Her name's Ellen Rohr, and the book is called How Much Should I Charge? And it gives you – it's not a big book. It just really helps give you the basics to understand how your pricing model should work. And people just say, I'm at this diner yesterday. I'm in Colorado Springs. Today I'm in Phoenix, but yesterday I was in Colorado Springs and it was way too busy. She said, to get sat, 
with a group of eight, because I was with my cousins, he said it's uh, about an hour and 20 minutes. And all in my mind, and this is funny because I didn't tell anybody there, but I'm like, you could literally double your prices. You could literally double them. And you still have maybe not every single person here, but the, the people that aren't here are the biggest, fussiest ones that are saying, I need another refill. Where's the butter? Where's the, the hot sauce? No, no, no. People that pay more were just easier. We're just like, yeah, that's fine. We're not complicated. So the first thing I'm thinking in my head was, it, it always comes back to the, 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 the cost. But I don't look at it as a cost. I look at it as an investment. You see, I, I deleted that word from my vocabulary. The, the price is this. The investment is this. You see, this is an investment. The only thing on your home, better than your bathroom or your kitchen, that gives you 100% return on investment. Remodel Magazine five years in a row is your garage door. We trademarked this, but it's the smile of your home and it's 40% of your curb appeal. Let's go ahead. Let's make an investment today. That I like hard. that. I like the smile at the end of it too. You got the nice smile at the end. You can't even help yourself, man. I can see it. You got uh, it. You got it. And I believe in it. I truly believe in, in what I'm doing. And, and you know, I, I don't think I'm the most expensive because there's there's people out there that just gouge. But I, I say, you know, at the end of the day, it's fair for me to pay myself a good wage and still bring home 50 to 20% for the company. And a lot of people, the small businesses, they go, I go, how much did you make last year, Nick? You know, 200 grand. I go, okay, 200 grand in the business, man. What'd you pay yourself? 200 grand. That's, that's the same. No, no, no. You need to pay yourself a six figures, you know, 100K. And your company still needs to make a couple hundred grand. So, because if I buy your business, I got to replace you or I got to pay you that 100 grand at, at, at the same time. So either way, and, and, and I love talking about how businesses make multiples and arbitrage. I don't think we have time to get into that today, but people could learn a lot if they just understood how a bare bones businesses should work. And the only way they can do that fast and effective is listen to podcasts like this and read more books and go visit some of the companies I'm talking about and ask a lot of questions. I asked a lot of dumb questions. Shoot, 15 years ago, I didn't know what an affiliate was. Now I'm like the biggest affiliate marketer guy in the world, but I love this stuff. So I think you got to be obsessed with, with, with your business. If you're not, uh, I just don't know if it'll be obsessed with you. I don't know if I could pay you back in the returns. I don't know. It's obviously not a living organism, but after a while with all the human beings that are in here, it becomes kind of a, a living thing. It's, it's crazy how it works. I was going to ask you another question, but you just kind of answered it. I was going to ask you if, if somebody's listening to this right now and, uh, and they're just scraping by and they want to build something that's really special, what, what steps should they be take should, should they be taking? But it's, it's really is it's read, ask the dumb questions and get obsessed with your business. And, uh, so if anybody wants to get in touch with you, right. Or hear more from you or, or, or anything like that, just somehow get a, get more, uh, Tommy Mello, where should they go and what should they be following? So I got a group on Facebook called Home Service Expert. It's the same as my podcast. We, we try to put as much value as possible. And then there's book, Home Service Millionaire. Um, I had Alivi teach us about manuals. I have the CEO of Service Titan here. He did the forward. He teaches us about CRMs. I've got Alan Ward that talks three pages about pricing. You learn all about service agreements from Darius Livers. Um, learn how to sell a business from Brian Cohen. I have the COO of uh, Home Advisor, David, here talking about lead gen. Um, I had 12 co-authors in this book, and I put a lot of, it took two years to write it. Um, I redid it a couple of times. Um, it's it's a good book. I wouldn't say it's a, a great, but the co-authors I had in here did a really good job. Uh, so if you got time and you own a home service business, this business is all about everything you need to know. It, it pretty much is it all in there. Um, I didn't talk as much as I should about as hiring a players. There's a whole chapter called hiring a players, but now I, I think I, I've cracked the code even more, but um, yeah. So I got the podcast home service expert, the the book home service millionaire, then the group on Facebook. We, we put a lot of great things in there from, from drug tests to background checks. So who to use, who to use for your void service, how to get cameras for the trucks, how to get cameras when no one else could get, or to get to, uh, vehicles when no one else is getting vehicles. We just talk about things that everybody has a hard time with, lowering your EMOD score on your workman's comp. There's great stuff that happened in that group, and um, it's free. So that's probably the best three. And, and 
you know, I'm always available to hit me up on Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, I email, whatever. I'm, I'm not hard to find. <laughs> uh, Tommy, I want to thank you for joining me on the show today. And I want to thank all of our listeners. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we will be back with another episode of Business Savvy soon. Hopefully with Tommy Mello back on to talk more about hiring and, and cracking that code. Uh, so be sure to check out previous episodes of our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and the Ring Savvy YouTube channel. See you next time, everyone.